This episode is brought to you by Jinx, the superfood-powered dog kibble everyone's been talking about. See the results for yourself and try their one-month transformation. Within the first few weeks, you'll see how Jinx can help with your dog's energy, mood, and even digestion. And it's all thanks to the high-quality ingredients they use, like organic chicken, Atlantic salmon, and grass-fed beef. Try the one-month transformation today. Find Jinx in your local Walmart. Do you know what to do if you spot a desert tortoise in the road? Do you even know why they're in the road? I don't. With desert tortoises about to emerge from brumation this spring, we're going to see a lot more of them out and about. So today on CityCast Las Vegas, we're talking to Beth Wolf, a local wildlife biologist and desert tortoise expert. She's going to tell us about why development in Las Vegas is threatening our beloved local dinosaurs and what we can do to help protect them. It's Tuesday, March 5th. I'm Sarah Lohman, and here's what Las Vegas is talking about. Welcome, Beth. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, my gosh. I am delighted. So first and foremost, please calm one of my greatest fears. What do I do if I see a desert tortoise in the road? Should I pick it up? Well, it depends on if you can safely stop your vehicle. Okay. Yeah, if you see a desert tortoise on a paved road and it's uh, safe to pull off the road and move it out of harm's way, that's the right thing to do. But definitely look out for your own safety first. Okay. If you can safely uh, get the tortoise from the middle of the pavement to the shoulder or a little bit off into the vegetation, that's that's a great thing to do because road strikes are one of the biggest threats to desert tortoises. Oh, no, I've heard that you have to keep them moving in the direction they were going in or they'll be lost forever. Is that true? They won't be lost forever, but that's that's generally the right thing to do is if, uh, you know, they're going east to west, move them onto the west side of the road and, you know, maybe 30 or 50 feet into the vegetation. Okay. But if you see a, a tortoise on the side of the road, you know, on the vegetated shoulder, yeah, you should just leave it alone. You really okay. should. If it's not right in harm's way, just leave them alone because they're actually drawn to the vegetation on the shoulders of roadways. There's more water there. And so sometimes there's I weeds. See. So they do tend to walk right on the side of the road, which can be alarming. Right. But the less we meddle with them, the better. Um, being if they're in on the, in- the side of the road, they're, they're probably not going to jump out into traffic. Hopefully not. Okay. Yeah. I've also heard they pee when you pick them up. Is that true? So sometimes they do if they're really stressed um, by the by the handle. Uh, tortoises retain their urine for sometimes a year or more in oh times God. of drought. And so one of their stress responses is to void their bladder uh, if they're in danger. But they don't do it very easily. You really have to harass a tortoise to avoid its bladder. So don't let that be your primary concern. Uh, just definitely safety for yourself and then getting the animal out of the way of traffic. I assume this is a defense mechanism. Is it like a particularly violent or smelly pee? It's pretty stinky, but it's not violent. No, it's just pee. What does it smell like? <laughs> just pee? Honestly, I've only ever had a tortoise void on me once in moving lots of tortoises over the years. So okay. it didn't strike me as particularly smelly, but it gets concentrated okay. if they haven't had a drink in a long time. And so I would imagine it's stinkier the, I, the longer they go. You can tell you're easing a lot of my anxieties already. <laughs> Don't um, worry about it. It won't ever happen to you. <laughs> if, I mean, I've heard also heard it's really dangerous for them to void too, because they're dependent on that water. It is. Yeah. It's, it's dangerous for them to void their bladder, especially if there's no um, way for them to, to get a drink. You know, if, mm. if it's been raining and they've been drinking a lot of water, they will also void more easily. Okay. But uh, the chances that they'll be able to rehydrate soon are probably good too. But during the drought, you know, we had a, a period of what, 240 days without yeah. rain a couple years yeah. ago. And the tortoises weren't moving around hardly at all at that point. And they were just conserving all of their energy and their urine and waiting for rain. 
So I'm also curious, too, why are visitors at Red Rock, they're always told to check under their cars before they leave for tortoises. Why is that? Yeah, that's a great question. So tortoises come out of their burrows. They spend 90% of their lives underground in burrows um, where the temperature is more stable. But during the active season, which is coming up, you know, they they become active with the warmer weather. Um, They cruise around in the morning eating and catching up with their friends and Mm -hmm. um, just doing what tortoises do. And on their walkabout, as the day gets warmer, they will seek shade you know, Mm. to cool off. So the shade of a parked vehicle is the best looking shade. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is my last in my rapid fire tortoise truth fee fiction. I've heard that some people apply to have desert tortoises come live in their backyards. Is that true? Really? Tell me more. Yeah. So tortoises are a popular pet um, throughout their range. And I was just looking at the tortoise group website recently. I think there's... um, you know, a hundred thousand captive tortoises or more. Mm. And so they're, they're popular pets, but they are very long lived Mm -hmm. and they breed very well in captivity. So there are plenty of tortoises born in captivity that will stay in captivity and live 80, Mm. 100 or more years. So if you, if you want to adopt a tortoise, uh, the best thing to do is probably to go to tortoisegroup.org. Mm-hmm. That is a nonprofit group that helps connect unhoused tortoises with <laughs> houses <laughs> that want tortoises. Yes. It is illegal uh, to adopt a tortoise from the wild. All tortoises, Mojave Desert tortoises, captive and wild, are the property of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and we are just their caretakers, even if it was born and raised. Because it is a federally threatened species, you have to have permission to own one. Um, You can't just go find one on a dirt road out behind your subdivision and bring it home. I mean, it's technically illegal to to own a desert tortoise, correct? They're not really in the pet trade. They're not in the pet trade. It's illegal to buy and sell desert tortoises, but you can adopt one. Legally. And that's essentially like a rescue tortoise. A, tor- yes. a tortoise needs to be rehomed for some reason. Okay. I mean, not really our pets. You're, you're kind of like creating an environment for them. You're caretaking them. Yes. And you need to have an approved habitat for right. them. But you've got to consider these tortoises, they've been around for millions of years on this landscape. Yeah. And it wasn't until relatively recently that they received federal protections. Yeah, I, you know, I hadn't thought about that. If these tortoises are living a century, then it's very reasonable that someone picked one up legally in the 70s or 80s, 80s and this tortoise is still knocking around and yes. not suitable for re-release in the wild. Absolutely. Yes, and it used to be that people would bring home several tortoises and put them on their property and um, mm-hmm. let them come and go, and they would breed there mm-hmm. as well. And so the captive population of You know, maybe their parents or their grandparents were collected from the wild back when it was legal. And then, you know, they're passed down through the family. And a a tortoise can have 14 babies in a year. And then again the next year. And then the next year. The females can be reproductive for over 80 years. Well, I guess they're not so slow moving on everything. No. No, they are are randy reptiles. (laughs) So my um, my producer just commented we should be putting tortoise care in our wills. And actually, my brother has a tortoise, not a desert tortoise, another like pet shop variety. Um, and before he had met his wife and was unmarried, he wanted to designate me the recipient of his uh, the benefactor of his life insurance policy. But he called me and said he would only do it if I took care of his tortoise. <laughs> Which is honestly part of the reason I didn't want him to get a tortoise in the first place, because he's older and I knew that I would end up taking care of that tortoise. Not my problem anymore. I've got a niece. That's her problem. Oh, great. She's agreed to care for the tortoise. I mean, she's three. So no, not yet, but she will. I love it. This episode is brought to you by Jinx, the superfood-powered dog kibble everyone's been talking about. See the results for yourself and try their one-month transformation. Within the first few weeks, you'll see how Jinx can help with your dog's energy, mood, and even digestion. And it's all thanks to the high-quality ingredients they use, like organic chicken, Atlantic salmon, and grass-fed beef. Try the one-month transformation today. Find Jinx in your local Walmart. So if they're so 
randy and fertile, like, why are they endangered? Yeah, that's a good question, too. So they reproduce well in the wild and in captivity, but there are a lot of threats to the population and especially to the juvenile tortoises. Mm -hmm. Um, When tortoises hatch out of the egg, they don't receive any parental care, like baby birds, Mm -hmm. the parents care for the babies. Most reptiles, when they hatch, they're just all alone in the world and have to figure it out. And that definitely goes for tortoises. And so very, very few of the eggs that hatch survive. Those tortoises Mm -hmm. generally I think it's about 90, 95% don't make it to adulthood. I mean, it is amazing me that out of the 14 babies that a tortoise could have in a year, maybe one of them will survive? Maybe one, but everything yeah. wants to eat a baby tortoise. And so hmm. it's it's the size of a chicken nugget and almost the texture of a chicken nugget. Their shells, oh. their <laughs> shells take at least five years to harden up in okay. the wild. And it can happen faster in captivity. Tortoises grow faster in captivity Mm. in general. But in the wild, yeah, five years is a long time for a tiny little chicken nugget to evade all the different predators that want to eat it. I mean, you've got foxes, you've got snakes, you've got ravens. Ravens are a big problem for juvenile tortoises, and they have keen eyes. So just about everything is better at finding those tiny baby tortoises than we are. And they make a good snack. Do you so, want to talk about corvids for a second? You want to talk about crows sure. and ravens? I'd love to. I know that you're that is where your your work has sort of evolved to. Yes. Yes, so I do a lot of work with uh common raven management. Ravens are a native uh native species of corvid mm. here in Nevada and all across North America and the population of ravens is bloated because of human human subsidies. Sure. You know, the garbage dumps, right. the water treatment plants the power lines that cross over the desert and provide a great place for them to build a nest Mm -hmm. and raise their babies. And then also it provides a place for the ravens to perch and look out over the landscape and spot those tortoises. Whereas Uh previously, you know, ravens would be flying over the land and they wouldn't have anywhere to stop and watch for Uh tortoises. They've got a bird's eye view, literally. They do. And they have very good eyesight and, and they're very resourceful birds. You know, they, Mm -hmm. they do eat tortoises, but they eat just about anything that moves and Mm -hmm. anything that's dead and garbage. They'll eat anything. They, they're drawn to development. They're drawn to activity Mm -hmm. and they see an opportunity at every new construction site to put up a nest nearby and eat on the garbage from the construction sites. And then, you know, they've got all those mouths to feed with their brood of five baby ravens. And yeah. that's really when they start bringing home the wildlife as well. You know, if there's not enough trash to eat, they'll bring home baby tortoises and feed those to their young. But uh-huh. they also are predators for native songbirds that build uh-huh. nests. They sit and they watch and they see those little birds tending to their young. And they, they will eat both the eggs and the nestlings right out of birds' nests, which is really sad. So if the boom in their population is human created, um, do we have a responsibility to sort of control their, control nature, but, you know, control their numbers in this case? I mean, that's, that's definitely an ethical question that we could talk about for a while. What is our responsibility, you know, to mitigate their population growth? I think Mm -hmm. that we do have a responsibility to, to do what we can to try and keep things in balance, but Ecology is very complicated and you start, you know, pulling on one string and it affects things over here. And, you know, there's no perfect solution for keeping Mm -hmm. things in balance. We're far past that. But as far as protecting the tortoises, I think working to keep the raven population in check, slow down their growth because they are so adaptable Mm -hmm. and such effective predators, I think we do have a responsibility to work on that and in a humane way for the birds as well. You know, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I I certainly wouldn't advocate going out and having an open season on ravens. They're Mm -hmm. incredible birds and, Mm -hmm. and uh, smart and they have relationships just like we do. Mm -hmm. Um, But we're working on, on more humane methods for slowing down their growth. So, you know, the population of Las Vegas is booming. Is the expansion of the city and development, is that also affecting tortoise populations? Yeah, it is. Mostly through habitat loss. Yeah. 
you know, it, it used to be before Las Vegas was a city, there were tortoises all over this valley. They were an abundant species. And they're a really important species, not just the sake of their existing, but they're what we consider a, a keystone species because they mm. provide habitat for a lot of other creatures that can't dig burrows. So mm-hmm. tortoises, desert tortoises are very effective diggers and they they dig out these long burrows, sometimes, you know, 10, 15, even 20 mm-hmm. feet deep in some cases that are a refuge from the heat for snakes, for rabbits, Mm -hmm. for Gila monsters, for burrowing owls, all of these other animals that need a dark, cool place to hang out in the summer sun, those burrows are dug by desert tortoise. So as Las Vegas expands and we get up against the hills, animals are not only displaced, but they're crowded in at the periphery and a lot of the habitat that mm. used to be their range is, is you know, paved over. Well, all those creatures like hang out with the tortoises in there or do they inhabit deserted burrows? Both. Sometimes both. I've looked into burrows and seen rattlesnakes. I've seen owls back there. Um, I've seen a snake and a, and a tortoise in there together. I've seen a bunny and a tortoise in there together. Now, Gila monsters and tortoises do not get along because Why? Gila monsters eat eggs. Oh. And tortoise eggs are often laid inside their burrow or right at the mouth. So they're mm-hmm. definitely a predator for the for the tortoise eggs. So the tortoises do have a sense for which animals are not a, a threat to them. They'll cuddle up with a bunny, but not with a gila monster. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's interesting. Yep. So I imagine a lot of policy has shifted since 1990 when the tortoises um, got federal protections. So has our policies for relocating these tortoises changed over the years? Uh, I know that you sometimes you work on new development sites. And I don't don't know if this is the right word for it, but you're like a tortoise mitigator, um, like looking out for tortoises and figuring out what to do with them on a, a development site. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah, I can I could try and get into that a little bit. So every every project is a little bit different and okay. it depends on where it's taking place, who owns the land. Um, a lot of the larger utility developments like the solar farms and the transmission lines that are going out on the desert, those projects are on federally owned land, BLM mm-hmm. land. And our public lands have some different rules for what a developer needs to do in order to stay in compliance for protecting wildlife. Those rules are negotiated project by project between the wildlife agencies and the project proponents. And what do you do if you find a tortoise and you're working on a site? What usually happens and has that changed over time? It's it's changed some over time as we learn more about what works for the for the tortoises themselves. Um, mm-hmm. On some projects, you know, projects that are crossing open habitat where construction is just sort of moving through, but there's no fence to put them on the other side of. In those cases, generally, we do not touch or move the tortoises. We just wait for them to move out of harm's way. Other projects where you know, they're going to completely obliterate a chunk of habitat. Mm -hmm. They fence it in. And then we do repeated surveys to make sure um, we find all of the animals inside the fence and we move them out of harm's way. And the, and the way that we do that is um, again, sometimes project to project, sometimes it's a short distance translocation, just right on the other side of the fence. And on other projects, for, you know, different reasons, the tortoises are moved farther, sometimes, Mm. you know, a few miles away or to a designated area. And on other projects, they're just held off site for a period of time before the fence is removed and Mm -hmm. they're sort of allowed to go back into their old home zone. I think I've heard that it, the further tortoises are moved away from their home zone, the, that they don't necessarily do as well. Yeah. Yeah. It can be, Uh, very traumatic for a tortoise to be moved a long distance because, you know, they're long-lived creatures and they have a really close relationship with their home range, where the plants um, that they prefer to eat tend to grow, where are the spots where water tends to accumulate for them to drink. Um, They have social relationships in the wild. They Mm. know who's who, who is where, and they have preferred burrows that they will use for years, decades, 
their winter burrows and their summer burrows. And so when you take an animal that only knows their home territory and you displace them with no roadmap, no friends, and you put them miles away, it's very difficult for them to adapt. And um, they tend to spend a lot more time above ground, Mm. walking around, trying to get their bearings, trying to find the food. And the more time they spend above ground, there's a greater likelihood that they will be predated by a badger or a Uh. coyote, or they will wander onto a road and get hit by a side-by-side. There's just a lot more threats when when they're walking around more. We have badgers here? We do. We have American badgers, and they can actually uh, be a real problem for tortoises if they get a taste. I have no idea. Yeah. All right. Last question. Why do you think Las Vegans should care about the desert tortoise? I mean, I would hope that Las Vegans care about all of their neighbors, you know, human Mm. and wildlife that we share this beautiful landscape with. And I think people should care about tortoises because... They were here before us, and they're one of the most benign, gentle creatures that um, we've got a, the privilege of, of sharing the landscape with. And we should all just like slow down a little bit and learn what we can from the wildlife, from tortoises, and, and from the birds that are also sharing the space. And But that's me. I'm a little bit of a hippie. <laughs> <laughs> Beth, I thought that was lovely. Thank you for for being on today. I feel much less anxious about encountering a tortoise. And I hope that one day I actually do get to encounter a tortoise in the wild. I hope you do too. Yeah, it should be a good spring for it. That's all for today here on CityCast Las Vegas. We'd love to hear your tortoise stories and questions. Reach out. Our email and phone number are in the show notes. And while you're at it, if you enjoyed the show, leave us a review. It helps other locals find us. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. Take care. Speaking of Mojave Max, do you want to get on the CityCast Las Vegas betting pool as to when Mojave Max is going to emerge? Wow, sure. I'm going to say um, April 10th. Do you have a time of day? 11 (laughs) o'clock. April 10th, 11 a.m. We'll let you know the prizes. I take the winner out for a slice of pizza. Oh, fantastic. Yeah.